Hi there. In our last lesson, we learned about cross-site scripting or XSS, which I recommend you check out because they are some of the most common vulnerabilities out there right now. In this lesson, we're looking at command injection, a vulnerability which allows us to execute commands through a vulnerable app and its remediations. I'm Brock from Brock Card Security, and let's get hacking. All right, so first things first, you're gonna to wanna to go ahead and log into your TriAcme dashboard and go to the command injection lesson. Introduction. What is command injection? In this room, we're gonna be covering the web vulnerability that is a command injection. Once we understand what this vulnerability is, we'll then showcase its impact and the risk it imposes on an application. Then you're going to be able to put this knowledge into practice, namely how to discover the command injection vulnerability, how to test and exploit this vulnerability using payloads designed for a different operating system, how to prevent this vulnerability in an application. Lastly, you'll get to apply theory into practice in a practical room at the end. To begin with, let's first understand what command injection is. Command injection is the abuse of an application's behavior to execute commands on the operating system using the same privileges that the application on a device is running with. We're taking advantage of what's already there. For example, achieving command injection on a web server running as a user named Joe will execute commands under this Joe user and therefore obtain any permissions that Joe has. A command injection vulnerability is also known as a remote code execution or RCE because an attacker can trick the application into executing a series of payloads that they provide without direct access to the machine itself, i.e. an interactive shell. The web server will process this code and execute it under the privileges and access controls of the user who is running that application. They think that we're Joe. Command injection is also often known as remote code execution because of the ability to remotely execute code within an application. These vulnerabilities are often the most lucrative to an attacker because it means that the attacker can directly interact with the vulnerable system. For example, an attacker may read some system or user files, data, and things of that nature. For example, being able to abuse an application to perform the command, who am I? To list what user account the application is running will be an example of command injection. Command injection was one of the top 10 vulnerabilities reported by Contrast Security's AppSec Intelligence Report in 2019. You can see that here for insights from Contrast Lab AppSec Intelligent Report. Moreover, the OWASP framework constantly proposes vulnerabilities of this nature as one of the top 10 vulnerabilities of a web application. Or you can just look at the OWASP framework. And here we have the top 10 most common web application security vulnerabilities or risks. And command injection would definitely share a lot of the traits with a lot of these. No answer needed, one mark completed. Discovering command injection. This vulnerability exists because applications often use functions in programming languages such as PHP, Python, and Node.js to pass data to and to make system calls on the machine's operating system. For example, taking input from a field and searching for an entry into a file. Take this code snippet below as an example. In the code snippet, the application takes data that a user enters in an input field named title to search a directory for a song title. Let's break this down into a few simple steps. Here we have our code snippet written in PHP, commonly used for web development. Step number one, the application is going to store the MP3 files in a directory contained on the operating system. You can see the directory here, var www.html songs. Number two, the user inputs the song title they wish to search for. The application stores this input into the title variable. You can see here the title variable and getting whatever the user inputs. The data within this title variable is passed to the command grep to search a text file named songtitle.txt for the entry of whatever the user wishes to search for. So we can see here the command grep and then whatever the title is and they're looking in songtitle.txt which probably has a list of different songs. The output of this search of songtitle.txt will determine whether the application informs the user that the song exists or not. If the grep command returns blank, then it's going to say that the title does not exist. However, if anything else happens, then it's gonna say the requested song does exist. Now, this sort of information would be typically stored in a database. However, this is just an example of where an application takes input from a user to interact with the application's operating system. Attacker could abuse this application by injecting their own commands for the application to execute. Rather than using grep to search for an entry in songtitle.txt, they could ask the application to read data 
from a more sensitive file. Now that's an abuse of trust right there with the operating system. Abusing applications in this way can be possible no matter the programming language the application uses. As long as the application processes and executes it, it can result in command injection. For example, this code snippet below is an application that was written in Python. Note, you are not expected to understand the syntax behind these applications. However, for the sake of reason, they have outlined the steps of how this Python application works as well. In number one, we see that the Flask package is used to set up a web server. In the code block number two, function that uses subprocess package executes a command on the device. In number three, we use a route in the web server that will execute whatever is provided. For example, to execute who am I, we need to visit HTTP and then flask app.thm slash who am I. What variable stores the user's input in the PHP code snippet in this task? Got any ideas? Hmm. If you said the title variable, then you'd be correct. What HTTP method is used to retrieve data submitted by a user in the PHP code snippet? G E T get. The get method is used to retrieve data submitted by a user, which we can see in step number two. Now, if I wanted to execute the ID command in the Python code snippet, what route would I need to visit? Well, if we need to go to the flaskapp.thm slash who am I route to use who am I, then we're gonna need to do slash ID to execute the ID command. Boop, boop. Nice job guys, on to the next one. Task three, exploiting command injection. You can often determine whether or not command injection may occur by the behaviors of an application as you will come to see in the practical session of this room. Applications that use user input to populate system commands with data can often be combined in unintended behavior. For example, the shell operators, the semicolon, the ampersand, and double ampersand will combine two or more system commands and execute them both. Double the power. If you're unfamiliar with this concept, it is worth checking out the Linux Fundamentals module to learn more about this. Linux Fundamentals covers many servers and security tools in Linux. Learn how to use the Linux operating system, which is a critical skill in cybersecurity. If you're interested in me going over the Linux fundamentals course, go ahead and let me know down in the comments. Command injection can be detected in mostly one of two ways. Number one, blind command injection, and number two, verbose command injection. These two methods are defined below and sections underneath will explain these in greater detail. Blind command injection is a type of injection where there is no direct output from the application when testing payloads much like blind XSS. You will have to investigate the behaviors of the application to determine whether or not your payload was successful. Number two, the verbose command injection is a type of injection where there is direct feedback from the application once you have tested a payload. For example, running the who am I command to see what user the application is running under. The web application will output the username on the page directly. Hmm, that sounds pretty nice. So how are we supposed to figure out if our command successfully worked if there's no visible output. It's not immediately noticeable. For example, a command is executed, but the web application outputs no message. However, just because it's not there, doesn't mean it didn't happen. For this type of command injection, we will need to use payloads that will cause some time delay. For example, the ping and sleep commands are significant payloads to test with. Using ping as an example, the application will hang for however many number of seconds in relation to how many pings you have specified. Another method of detecting blind command injection is by forcing some output. This can be done by using redirection operators such as the right arrow. If you're unfamiliar with this, I recommend checking out the Linux fundamentals module. For example, we can tell the web application to execute commands such as who am I, and then redirect that to a file. We can then use commands such as cat to read this newly created file's content. Testing command injection this way is often complicated and requires a bit of experimentation as the syntax for commands varies between Linux and Windows. The curl command is a great way to test for command injection. This is because you were able to use curl to deliver data to and from an application in your payload. Take this code snippet below as an example. A simple curl payload to an application is possible for command injection. Here we have the curl command and it looks like using the process.php and then we're searching the directory beetles to execute the who am I command. Detecting verbose command injection is a little different. It's arguably the easiest method of the two. Verbose command injection is when the application gives you feedback or output as to what is happening or being executed. For example, the output of commands such as ping or who am I is directly displayed on the web application. Here they have compiled some valuable payloads for both Linux and Windows into the tables below. So we have who am I, which is in both Linux and Windows. Who am I sees what user the application is running under. If I'm logged in as Joe and counting a file, 
can we see that Joe's logged in? And then for Linux, it's going to be LS, which stands for list listing the contents of the current directory. You'll be able to find files like configuration files, environment files, tokens, application keys, and many more valuable things. On the flip side, in Windows, you're going to be using DIR, which is that operating system's counterpart. You'll be able to find the same sort of things. Ping is a command that will invoke the application to hang. This will be useful in testing the application for blind command injection. Sleep is another useful payload in testing the application for blind command injection where the machine does not have ping installed. Sleep is specific to Linux and so is NC, which stands for Netcat. Netcat can be used to spawn a reverse shell onto the vulnerable application. Netcat can be used to respawn a reverse shell onto the vulnerable application. You can use this foothold to navigate around the target machine for other services, files, or potential means of escalating privileges. Timeout is specific to Windows, and it's a command that will also invoke the application to hang. It's useful for testing the application for blind command injection if the ping command is not installed. What payload would I use if I wanted to determine what user the application is running as? How about this? Who am I? Whoop, whoop. What popular network tool would I use to test for blind command injection on a Linux machine? How about ping? What payload would I use to test a Windows machine for blind command injection? How about timeout? Whoop, whoop. We got it correct. All right, on to task four, remediating command injection. Command injection can be prevented in a variety of ways. Everything from minimal use of potentially dangerous functions or libraries in a programming language to filtering input without relying on a user's input. I have detailed these a bit further below. The examples below are the PHP programming language. However, the same principles can be extended to many other languages. In PHP, many functions interact within the operating system to execute commands via shell. These include exec, pass through, and system. Take this snippet below as an example. Here, the application will only accept and process numbers that are inputted into the form. This means that any commands such as who am I, will not be processed. Number one, the application will only accept a specific pattern of characters, in this case, the digits zero through nine. The application will then only proceed to execute this data, which is all numerical. These functions take input such as a string or user data and will execute whatever is provided on the system. Any application that uses these functions without proper checks will be vulnerable to command injection. Input sanitization, sanitizing any input from a user that an application uses is a great way to prevent command injection. This is a process of specifying the formats or types of data that a user can submit. For example, an input field that only accepts numerical data or removes any special characters, such as the right arrow, the ampersand, and the forward slash. In the snippet below, the filter input PHP function is used to check whether or not any data submitted via an input form is a number or not. If it is not a number, it must be invalid input. Here we have the filter input function, which is saying if it's a number, hey, we're gonna try to use it. It's probably followed by an else statement saying, hey, don't use the input. Just like if you go to the border and you're not a citizen or you don't have a green card, you're gonna be sent back from where you came, unless you find a way to bypass the rules. Applications will employ numerous techniques in filtering and sanitizing data that is taken from a user's input. These filters will restrict you to specific payloads. However, we can abuse the logic behind an application to bypass these filters. For example, an application may strip out quotation marks. We can instead use the hexadecimal value of this to achieve the same result. When executed, although the data given will be in a different format than what is expected, it can still be interpreted and will have the same result. Here's our payload, and they would normally strip out the quotation marks, but because we put everything hexadecimal, it's not recognizing that we've encoded our quotations. It's just in another language. What is the term for the process of cleaning user input that is provided to an application? Sanitization. What? Sanitize is used primarily in the US. In Canada, sanitize is preferred everywhere else. Hmm. Okay. So if using the Z, it's not necessarily wrong, but for this, they want us to use the S. And we got it correct. Deploy the machine attached to this task. It will be visible in the split screen view. Deploy the machine. All right, it's booting up. Once your machine boots up, we're gonna use some payloads on the application hosted on the website, visible in the split screen view to test for command injection. Refer to this cheat sheet if you are stuck or wish to explore some more complex payloads. That is very nice of them. Here we have a whole list of compounded Unix commands to try and perform a command injection. Likewise, in Windows, we also see some similar commands, such as multiple ampersand, point sleep, 
who am I, and other commands. Find the contents of the flag located in slash home slash tryhackme slash flag dot txt. You can use a variety of payloads to achieve this. I recommend trying multiple. To start off, we'll just go ahead and try the default IP address and see what it returns. So this is a handy web application for diagnosing IT problems. It's testing the availability of a device by entering the IP address. It looks like whatever is running behind the hood grabbed our IP address and put it into a ping command, so then it gave us back some ping statistics. However, that doesn't tell us what operating system is running behind the hood. Let's try a command that'll sift the operating systems down a little bit to see if this is a Windows machine or a Linux or Unix machine. We'll go ahead and do 127.0.0.1, satisfying the IP address requirement. And then we're going to do the ampersand to run an additional command and run a command only available in a Unix machine. And we will have it sleep for 10 seconds. If we execute it and it's a Unix system, should wait for 10 seconds before it brings us back anything. So far it's not returning anything, and there we go. So let's look at the cheat sheet. If we go down to the Windows commands, 127.0.0.1, then we'll try the directory command. <laughs> Looks like we're not given any users. Let's try an alternative method. Let's see if we can look inside the root home directory using ls through 127.0.0.1 ls. Huh. It looks like it responded to the ls of eight directories or files inside the root home trihack directory. A total of four in the slash home slash ubuntu directory. And provided us with the flag.txt.save file. So we know it's there. Now we use to answer this question right here. What are the contents of the flag located in slash home slash trihackme slash flag.txt? Now that we've stumbled upon it, we should be able to do 127.0.0.1 ampersand if this system responded to a unix command of ls we should also be able to use the cat command to look inside the flag.txt file then there'll be slash home slash try hack me slash flag.txt dot save go ahead and execute that we have successfully done a command injection attack way to go as you can see THM command injection complete is the answer for the next question. All right, what user is this application running as? Let's try this dollar sign semicolon user bin ID. Put in the IP address, followed by the ampersand, and then dollar sign semicolon. Okay, looks like we got something. Now we should be able to look at the Etsy password file and find whoever user ID is 33. 7.0.0.1 and we'll the cat, and then we'll go to the root directory, Etsy directory, password. Let's go. Oh, wow, we just got a lot of good info. Now we're specifically looking for user ID 33, but we have a lot of different user IDs flying around here. Now, if you're a nitpicker, you could do control F 33. It looks like the www-data user in the currently signed in. If we wanted to make this a little cleaner, we could have done 127.0.0.1 and ran the cat command, but piped it to grep for 33. Now we can see right off the bat, okay, yes, the user www-data must be currently signed in because when we look in the user ID folder of whoever was signed in, we saw that same 33 and enter the answer. I just want to say it's unlikely when you're starting out that you're going to know a lot of these different commands and payloads. Just go through each command, rinse and repeat. Try it out. If it doesn't work, hey, try something else. Having that determination is going to go a long way. Trust me, the field of cybersecurity is changing so much that you can't be expected to learn a single command injection attack and just hope it stays the way it is. No, there's many, many different types of command injection attacks. There's command injections attacks that we haven't even thought of yet. Well done for making it to the end of the room. To recap, we've learned about the following elements of command injection. How to discover the common injection vulnerability. How to test and exploit this vulnerability using payloads designed for different operating systems. How to prevent this vulnerability in an application. And how to apply our learning by performing command injection in a practical application. As you will probably have discovered, there are multiple payloads that can be used to achieve the same goal. I highly encourage you to go back to the practical element of this task and try some alternative methods of retrieving the flag. So go ahead and click complete, whoop whoop, and celebrate. You guys just learned a critical skill in cybersecurity Give yourself a pat on the back. We are truly pioneers in the cyber west. And it's up to us to keep poking, keep prodding, and looking for vulnerabilities because you never know. One day, you could find something that impacts thousands, even millions of people. That's a big deal. It's like Edison. 
don't expect your first or 999th time of trying to work. Thanks for sticking around guys. Like, subscribe. This marks our ninth complete lesson in the Introduction to Web Hacking course. I'll see you in the last lesson of Intro to Web Hacking where we're gonna go over SQL injection. It's gonna be a fun one, guys. Keep hustling and take care.